Hello, everyone. My name is Hayden Lee. I'm a master certified executive uh, life and leadership coach, as well as Enneagram specialist. So welcome to my Enneagram series. We've been focusing on uh, from vice to virtue, and I'm so excited to be exploring the vice and virtue of um, type eight today. Before we dive into that, as a reminder, the Enneagram is a great system of self-awareness and a system of development. And as I like to say, it's even a system of self-liberation because the Enneagram, uh, we explore nine types of motivation and how each type, um, really we have default patterns of behavior, uh, thinking and feelings. And a lot of those times, those default patterns hold us back or, or, or they, or they, you know, chain us for lack of a better word. So that's why I say the more aware of it, then you can use the Enneagram as a map to grow and to develop and liberate yourself so you can be more productive and uh, effective and really be more authentic and be more free. I, and I always like to emphasize the Enneagram is about motivation, not behavior. You know, there's nine types of motivation in the Enneagram and um, there may be actually, uh, this, there may be the same behavior from nine different people but they could be nine different Enneagram types because their motive, the motivation is different, but they may be behaving the same way. And with that said, each type has a vice and each type has a virtue. The vice being a default you know, fixation with doing things that may be holding you back. And the virtue is this guiding light or a North star to remember, to really set you free to you know, release the burden of the, the vice and to become a more truer, freer, authentic self. All right, so let's dive into type eight today. So type eight, I'm so fascinated by my friend and my colleague, uh, Parisa Benia. Be I always, I wanna say Benia. Benia. Benia, Benia, I'm so sorry. I always like Benia. No, no, it's okay. Benia. Honestly, I've, I've had so many people like butcher it that that is like the I need truth good. It. I need I wrote it out phonetically. I even wrote it out phonetically and still said it wrong. But Parisa Bania. Yes, my friend. So yeah, yes. go ahead and introduce yourself. Who are you? Where are you? What do you do? Uh so my name is Parisa. I am a business whisperer. What does that mean? Uh that means that I am passionate about working with driven senior leaders, high performers to connect to their portal so that they step fully into their power. Um, I invite and challenge them to do that. And so the way that happens is that uh, I help validate what's important to them. I rewire and reframe their mindsets and skill sets so that ultimately they can get the flip out of their own way, insert whatever F word you like there. <laughs> And the reason why I love to do this is I think their full power is found in their transformation. I see in my mind's eye, the outsized impact they have on other people. And I am the vessel to help them do that. I love that. And I love how you are an awesome type eight, right? Cause type eight, I already hear even, but it's so evident, you know, even the words with which you just described what you do, I heard the word passion. I heard the word power and I heard the word strength, which is all, you know, um, about the type eight, not that there's other sides to the, the eight, of course, but that is a huge part of the characteristics of the eight where type eight, the motivation of the eight really is about um, having control, being in control and being strong, and then also avoiding weakness and vulnerability. But of course, as we know in all the types, the things which we avoid the most is also the things that will help us grow the most, right? <laughs> right. As you know as well. Mm -hmm. With that said, um, yeah, I mean, the vice of each type, like I said, is the fixations or the patterns we have that could hold us back. So the vice for type eight is lust. Right. And mm -hmm. that word, that word is just lustful. Even that word is lustful and, and lust, you know, not so much just in the sense of like, you know, like sexual lust, but also in the sense of like lust for power without mm -hmm. restraint, excess, doing more, wanting more, wanting it now, <laughs> you know, so mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. tell us how that shows up in your life and how it can get you in trouble. Yeah, I, um, one more that just bubbled up for me related to uh, lust, and you alluded to it, is impatient. Uh, I am not unafraid of doing the work. 
I am not afraid of hard work, but it gets to a point in time where I have such high standards for myself that if I'm not at whatever the level of output or whatever that I've set for myself, I am so brutally impatient. Uh, I become, uh, I beat myself up. I get very impatient with other people. And it's, it's, it's this idea of everything should be happening right now. And it's not, again, coming from a place of unwilling to do the work. And it's not even about entitlement. It's, I am willing to work hard. Why does this feel harder than it needs to be? Like, I am all in, I'm throwing all my resources, I'm throwing all of my attention at it, I'm throwing all my focus at it. And then where kind of um, comparison becomes a thief of joy, I'm like, X person over here, uh, it feels so easy for them, or it seems so easy for them. By golly, <laughs> it should be that way for me too. And so the the, the abuse, the self-recrimination that I'm not enough or I don't do enough or I'm somehow bad or I'm failing and, and all of the, just like the really passionate stuff that comes out when things don't happen on a timeline I envision is, is how that really represents itself for me. That's so fascinating. You know, earlier I said how the Enneagram is in a way, a system of self-liberation, right? And how our vice is a way to really enslave us. And sometimes when we speak about lust in the type eight, we even say it's like the type eight can be a slave to her desires, meaning like whatever it is she wants, if she's not getting it fast enough, like you're saying, then you beat yourself up and then you get upset, you compare yourself to others. Um, so how, yeah, how's that land with you? Like, Rather, the, rather what you want, your desires, when you don't have them, you become a slave to them rather than you really being in control, right? Because the lust part is also you cannot control sometimes how you feel, right? Yeah. So tell us about that. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, like story of my life. Uh, if things don't happen on a particular timeline or, um, or things don't happen to a degree or I don't get results to the degree I'm, I'm hoping for. Um, you know, there's a bit of a temper tantrum, I'm not gonna yeah. lie. Uh, sometimes it's a pity party, sometimes it's, uh, it's a temper tantrum. Um, and uh, it, it ends up being this thing that feeds itself. It's so I'm, I'm completely there with you. It, it, it really does, um, it really ends up being a slave to what your outsized expectations are of yourself. And it's not, and sometimes these expectations are much higher than what other people have for you. But you say, you kind of gamify yourself. You're like, well, so, you know, someone told me that I will only do, you know, make 10, let's say widgets. They're like, well, I'm just going to make 20. Mm -hmm. And if you only make 18, you're like, well, <laughs> I didn't make 20, but if you ignore the fact that you exceeded someone else's expectations of, of making 10 widgets, it's just this, it's never ending. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because remember the motivation for the eight is about control. So yeah. how, do, what's, how do you link what you just shared and the lust with control? Uh, you know, it's really great. Uh, it's really great question. Uh, yeah, eights are eights are control freaks. We want to we want to be able to dictate and determine a particular outcome. Mm. Um, and if we choose to not participate in a particular outcome, we'll say things like, "Oh, well, that was more important to that person, so I just let them have it." <laughs> right? Like, it's it's this. It's always about this idea of uh, of I can control or I have decided not to control something. Yeah. But if there are circumstances that are outside of our control, it's not that we don't see that there are variables that are just beyond our reach. It's just that we are, are personally offended that that's the case, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that we're like that's that's unjust. That's not right. Um, but you know. There you have it. Control is definitely a thing. <laughs> well, it's also interesting about control um, and lust in terms of desires. It's like, um, oh, sometimes, you know, eights can be very black or white. 
yeah or nothing so in terms of like the lust it's almost like well you know what you want but you also know what you don't want so it's like you know what you want i know and i, and I want it now and things that you know you don't want you don't really care about it. it's like not a big deal but it's like yeah you know the it's either black or white there's no it's very like clear in your mind like what you want and what you don't want yeah yeah and it's not like the things that we don't want we don't see that those things may have merit or value uh for other people i mean uh as, as much as i'd like to joke that eights are like mouth breathing knuckle draggers it's not like we don't see that other people have different values from us it's just that if it's not important to me i don't want to waste my time on it yeah yeah I love, but yeah, I love it. Just like even, but that language of like waste time, you know, it's like, um, but it, it can be extreme. That's what I mean. Like, you know, AIDS can have be extreme on either end. Um, and also I want to, one last point about the lust, like if you don't get what you want or, or, or on the quest to get what you want now, like um, AIDS might be demanding, <laughs> right? Come off as demanding or, um, possessive so does that resonate with you at all other of those like the demanding part of the possessive part uh, the demanding part sure um if if we think things are well we i if i think something is taking too long uh and i'm not i'm not more aware of how i'm showing up it would be like well how hard is this like this is not rocket science or, you know, this, we are not, you know, reinventing the wheel here. It's pretty straightforward, you know, X plus Y is Z. And so that's where, um, that's where that might uh, show up. The other piece, I don't know, the, the demanding, the demanding 100% uh, that, that I have, I have unreason. I may have unreasonable expectations, but again, to be clear, I don't have more unreasonable expectations for other people than I do for myself. And it's probably fair to say I have two times more unreasonable expectations of me than I would of anyone else. I am my own worst judgy enemy. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. I think, uh, judgment you know is something that eights can struggle with judgment of themselves and also judgment of others yeah which is a which is a good segue to the virtue of the eight right because whereas the the vice is lust the virtue is something to strive for or a guiding light or this even this principle that touch upon and you mentioned judgment so one way to the virtue of the eight is innocence right so striving towards innocence or touching upon mm -hmm. innocence and I always think of a childlike innocence or childlike awe. And innocence is non judgmental. And innocence is not jaded, right? Mm -hmm. And innocence is just, you know, kind of seeing things with fresh, innocent eyes and appreciating whatever it is, right? So, yeah. how does innocence, that virtue, help you? And how will that set you free? Yeah. So, I think. I think that's why I love coaching as much as I do, uh, especially uh, coaching people who are dealing with complex business issues, let's say, or, or people issues, is because there is this freedom and liberty of standing in front of a whiteboard and playing. That there, there are no rules at that point. Uh, every outcome is perfect because this particular thing that we're talking about, maybe it's not been tried before and, and every outcome is perfect that, you know, if it's great outcome, great, keep doing it. If it's a bad outcome, okay, great, great. You don't need to do it anymore. So leaning into this ambiguity, leaning into creativity is where fun lives with me. Anything that seems like it's rote or um, repetitive is actually where some of my dark side comes out. I get way impatient. But if it's, but if it feels like it's, I don't know, like a bunch of Play-Doh and, and stuff like that, awesome. <laughs> what, are we, what are we going to make today? So what happens when you step into that space of like innocence and playfulness? What happens to the need for control or the sense of control? 
You know, it doesn't live as much for me because we're brainstorming, right? We're playing. And so for me, that's what a lot of coaching feels like. And it's not to say that I don't take what the client brings seriously, but a lot of times what we have are more brainstorming conversations. How do we unpack what um, the client may be experiencing in that moment or what we've talked about, decided to talk about for that day? A lot of that feels like brainstorming. A lot of that feels like yes and. Yeah. What if questions, the open-ended questions, the Socratic questions to get to that point where there might be an insight. And I don't have skin in the game. And uh, because we're brainstorming, they don't, even though it's about them, they don't have skin in the game either because all we're doing is playing. Yeah. And that's where, that's where it's fun for me. It's what's fascinating is even how you describe the playfulness in this moment, there's a, there's a lightness about your energy, which is different than the, like, uh, the passionate energy just a few minutes ago. Both energies are important, but it's just yeah. talking about play like you, like you are now, there's a more of a lightness. And that's also a gift of the innocence for the aid is sometimes when they you know, soften the edges, right? Or sometimes just relax a bit, it let go of the excess, you know, and the, and the, and the impatience. So it's really quite a beautiful thing. Uh, yeah, how do, I mean, any insight on that, just how your energy shifts when you talk about yeah. playfulness and innocence? Yeah, you know what's fun about uh, when I'm in sessions like that is that I have left whatever I'm stressed out about at the door. Like it's, it's in a box, it's somewhere else. And uh, so there's no pressure, there's no weight. All I have to do is show up fully. Yeah. And so when I'm able to do, there are some days that I'm better at it than others. I'm not perfect, of course, but well, <laughs> I'm not perfect. But, uh, but when I really feel like I'm in that mode and then I've gotten really good at finding clients that will help me be in that mode more often, oh, it's fun. And, you know, like Gay Hendricks says, you know, when you're in your zone of genius, it always feels like play. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where, that's where um, I want to be. I'm aware of my power, um, but I also am aware of uh, what joy, creativity, and brainstorming can bring. Yeah. So Parisa, the million dollar question is, outside of coaching, what areas of your life could benefit from this innocence and playfulness and lightheartedness? You know, it's a great question. Uh, I think what I'm hungry for is uh, finding ways to play. Um, I don't know if it's if it's like a new hobby or something like that but um i want to bring in a little bit more creativity i don't quite know what that is yet mm -hmm. i used to be part of uh a book club maybe it's that but that just means using my head yeah. um, that feels a little heavy for me um but you know, something, something that feels creative. That's the thing. And I don't know what that creative thing is. I wish I could take a cooking class, but COVID. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, so anything that will uh, allow that joy to, to be in my life would probably be good. Well, I wonder if there's online cooking classes. I mean, maybe something. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, but, but there I, are. Yeah, but I love the connection you're making that... Um, between innocence and joy, right? Because you just said finding things to do, to just play and have fun, there's joy there. And then there's innocence there too. Like, you know, some something to just do that you're not an expert in yet, or you don't really know just for the sake of doing it for fun and for innocence and play once again, right? Yeah. And you know, the, the and I know that I'm not alone in saying this, but uh, I didn't, I didn't realize how much travel like meant to me, like, you know, vacations, great. You relax, you know, every December I would go to Riviera Maya and like sit under a falafel. Um, but uh, I was supposed to go to Croatia last year for a milestone birthday. And I was really leaning into that 
to the adventure of that. And one of the things that I had committed to myself to do is to travel more, to, and especially to places that I had not been. And, you know, try different food, try different, go to different places, just kind of drink in all of the culture. And, you know, knock on wood, once we all have been jabbed and whatnot, I am so motivated to hop on a plane and have new experiences. I'm, I'm grieving this inability to not have experiences. Wow. Well, you know, as we uh, wrap up the session, you know, I, I want to ask you, when you find yourself in the vice, right, of lust, how can you remember to go towards your virtue? What will that look like? That's a good question. The first thing that just bubbled up for me is um, what I typically do. I, I don't necessarily say like, what's the opportunity here, but I will typically force myself into some sort of brainstorming um, or, you know, how do I fix how do I make better so that I don't stay in the lower level energy uh, for too long? Um, it's almost like my lower level impatience energy is the ignition switch sometimes, a lot of times for that creativity. So I don't, I don't turn my back on it so much as I see where it can serve me, if that makes sense. Yeah, I like that seeing it with that just with a different pair of eyes, right? Where can it serve me? What can I learn from this, right? That's powerful. Um, and when you do do that, how does it kind of, how does it dampen some of that, you know, impatience or that need for excess now? Yeah, it's interesting. The way I describe it, I don't, it's almost like a trampoline. <laughs> like it's, I need, I need that depth, I need that, I need that pissed offness, I need that impatience. And then like the adrenaline all of a sudden like is a burst of creativity or it leads to that burst of creativity. And I'm like, ah, oh, I know what it is that I can do. And throughout my life that has been true. Um, and sure, it's not that I'm not creative without that, but, but when I need to feel that negative energy, whatever that is, to be able to really leap much higher into where the creative spot in my mind is. Um, so I'm like, yeah, I get pissed because something good is going to happen <laughs> after this. So I'm like, it's not, you know, it's not always the best thing uh, for every situation, but the, the situations that matter, it has really served me to fully feel so I can have that springboard or that trampoline. Yeah. That's awesome. It's like using the, that passion or, you know, as fuel and, you know, and we didn't talk too much about this, but, you know, anger is, you know, a part of the aid and anger isn't always a bad thing. In fact, like you saying, sometimes that passion or that anger can be fuel. And then, it, and then once it propels you up, then you could also see the, you know, innocence of it too. So it's all, it's like vice to virtue is almost like, um, it's like an ongoing cycle, really. It's like, yeah. oh, I'm in the vice, let me touch for my virtue. And then you get back into the vice and the virtue. And um, yeah, I love that tramp trampoline, that trampoline metaphor. And sometimes it's like when you're bouncing up higher, you can like see things more freshly and see things more clearly with a little bit of that kind of childlike innocence. You know, and sometimes the higher you go, you'll be able to see above the trees of things you wouldn't have seen before. So wonderful. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, thank you so much, you know, for sharing with us a little bit of the vice and virtue of the eight. Uh, if people want to uh, find you, where, where can they find you if they want to find out more about you? I am on LinkedIn, Parisa Bania, and uh, my website is sixcentsstrategy.com. Nice. Cool. Thank you. And what, what are your final words on an eight? What would you like the world to know? Uh, wonderfully complex and fun. I agree. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderfully complex and fun. Well, well, thank you folks for watching. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, please go ahead and you know subscribe to my YouTube channel, Hayden Lee Coaching. And you can visit me at HaydenLee.com. That's my website, H-A-Y-D-E-N 
L-E-E dot com. And you can find out more about my work, including my Enneagram groups that I run. So thank you, everyone. And thank you, Parisa, for joining us today. And thank you, viewers, for watching. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone.